Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. I do want you to know that it's an honor to speak for this impressive gathering today. I am the son of parents of modest formal education and the product of fairly modest schooling myself. But here I stand before all of you who have dedicated your lives to scholarship. And I do wonder what, if any, words of wisdom I might offer other than perhaps to try to make sense of our current moment in history. With that in mind, let me begin with a slight rephrasing of Shakespeare. Friends, countrymen, scientists of the world, lend me your ears. For the next 25 minutes or so, I want to speak to you from my head and my heart. Speak to you about the possibility of a new age of reason. This is in the spirit of, in an amended quote from Tennyson, ours is not just to live and die, ours is to reason why. I've seen a lot over the course of my lifetime, a result of my age and of my chosen career as a journalist. I've covered maybe too many individual stories to count, some like the assassination of President John F. Kennedy and the terror attacks of 9-11, are seared in my memory. But increasingly, I'm struck by the broader themes that I have witnessed, the lines and curves that emerge when you plot individual story points along the axis of history. The struggle for civil rights, the digital revolution, a burgeoning environmental movement, and so many more. As these waves of change lap upon us, it's not always clear where we are heading or what will the next tide bring. We need to prepare ourselves for an unpredictable future by sorting out facts from the noise, by challenging our own biases and preconceptions, by celebrating the, boast, the most uh, best and creative instincts of the human mind, and by expanding the knowledge upon which we make decisions. Thankfully, as a species, we have created a marvelous framework to organize our energies towards such worthy goals. It's called science. I believe science represents a pinnacle of human achievement, like art, music, and literature. With science, we have expanded our ability to observe and understand our universe far beyond the limits of the physical senses provided to us by nature, we have learned to see, hear, and touch the vastness of space, the microscopic tools of life, and the chemistry of our planet. We can eradicate a disease like smallpox and learn to generate our own energy from the sun. It is because of people like you who marry the instinct of to dream big with the skill to turn notions into data and data into an expansion of what we know to be true. But now we find ourselves in a moment of reckoning, especially here in the United States, yet there are echoes of it around the globe. Are we going to guide our future by science, reason, and knowledge, or are we going to succumb to superstition, ignorance, and propaganda? The fate of our very planet is at stake, something on which so many of you in this room have been sounding an urgent alarm. Earth is warming. Human activity plays a major role. We can, if we act with speed and purpose, likely mitigate some of the harm, but Will we? Can we? And what does our failure to confront climate change say about our ability to handle other crises of the present and the future? In many ways, the story of climate science should be seen as a great triumph. Look at how much we've learned and how quickly we've learned it. 
Look at how a global and diverse community of researchers has collaborated to put a complex puzzle together. These are the forces that give me optimism. I look out at this audience and see a can-do spirit that hopefully can save us from ourselves. But will the world listen? Here is where I think my experiences as a journalist resonate with what I've come to learn about the scientific enterprise. I believe we journalists and scientists are in many ways kindred spirits. We both try to get as close to the truth as is humanly possible. We both work with imperfect tools and high levels of uncertainty. We both must constantly challenge our own assumptions. And we both must have a rigorous acknowledgement of our errors. Yet, we journalists and scientists are both under siege, beset by accusations of fake news, self-interest, and bias. Much of this comes, and let us mark well, through coordinated attacks from powerful actors who have a vested interest in the truth remaining hidden. Confusion and false equivalents are their weapons. Journalism and science, when practiced to the highest standards, are rooted in nuance and fairness. Those who seek to undermine our purpose play by no such rules. Sadly, the forces arrayed against us are not new. I came of age as a reporter in the 1950s, during the height of McCarthyism and the Red Scare. Journalists were under attack, as were many scientists and others from lines of work that championed reason. We learned that America, like other nations, can be swept by a wave of irrationality, and the dangers of this undertow lurk ever underfoot. With that in mind, the question comes, of course, are we doomed to despair? Thankfully, I'm convinced the answer is an emphatic no. Let us fight the dark pull of cynicism. Skeptics make good scientists and good journalists. Cynics do not. I think it would be a mistake to be too pessimistic about how readily and eagerly the public could em embrace science. Science touches on some of the most fundamental human qualities, exploration, curiosity, wonder, and awe. Look at the millions from all walks of life who don special glasses and look to the skies during the recent solar eclipse. It turns out that a majority of the most popular museums in the United States are dedicated to science and space. Walk their galleries and you will see people of all ages from around the globe engaging with the exhibits. Meanwhile, the public waits eagerly for new medical advances and readily adopts new technologies. The human mind is wired to be interested in science. But somehow, much of the story of science is being lost in popular culture. And I believe this breeds much of the dangerous distrust that we are witnessing and experiencing today. It has been a crisis that has been brewing for years. It's exacerbated by growing cynicism towards elites, educated people, including scientists, from a sizable percentage of the public. Now, this is not a phenomenon limited to one political tribe. Yes, we have denial of climate change on the right, but also suspicion of vaccines and GMOs on the left. So how do we start to change this dynamic? I believe it must start with a new approach to engagement and building innovative bridges of understanding. I want to see a revolution in how we communicate science in content, form, and distribution. Often scientists are criticized for not being better communicators or for not taking communication with enough seriousness. 
And there's always room for improvement, and I do hope the science community embraces the importance of communication with more urgency. But I'm going to let you off the hook a bit. Your job is to be great researchers, to understand data, to dream up ingenious experiments. That is what you are trying to do. My job, those of us in the business, in the craft of, of communication, our job is to be storytellers, to shape narratives so that they are compelling but also truthful. When it comes to science, we can be doing this a whole lot better. For instance, what if we thought about science communication, well, more scientifically? What if we were not afraid to confront our biases about what the public might find interesting if presented well? And perhaps more importantly, what if we created a new paradigm for the creation of science content? Now, we've seen the benefits of a multidisciplinary approach to scientific research. Why not for science communication? Imagine a world where the best scientists and the best storytellers work together in ongoing collaborations. Not where the scientists are brought on at the end of a project and sort of hung up like Christmas tree ornaments to make sure statements are factually accurate. No, we need to make sure the spirit of science is presented accurately. Imagine if some of the most creative writers, cinematographers, and distribution specialists were working to tell the stories of science. Just as I believe our brains are wired to accept and appreciate the wonder and awe of science, I think our minds are also ready to respond, nearly always, to stories. Tell me a story is one of the most often used phrases in any language and has been for many centuries. Well, bringing these two elements, science and stories, together could be extremely powerful. To be sure, there is some good science storytelling today, but we can and should strive always to be better. Growing up, I was turned off to science because of all the rote memorization I encountered in school. It was never explained to me, at least my recollection, it was never explained to me why things were the way they were, just that they were. And apparently it's not just me. A few years back, I interviewed the great British scientist, Sir Paul Nurse. Well, long before Dr. Nurse was knighted, or Mark you won the Nobel Prize, he was a struggling science student in the introductory classes in college. He told me he had a terrible memory for, quote, all the bits of information that you needed to pass exams. Like me, Dr. Nurse had trouble memorizing the periodic table. What really mattered for me, he explained, was understanding the basis and the order. Then I could put the names to it. If I was just learning the names with no order, I was hopeless, end quote. Sadly, I believe a dogmatic approach to teaching science is depriving students and the general public from enjoying the most marvelous quality, that is, the joy and awe of discovery. The way too many of us talk about science turns scientific knowledge into some kind of distant gospel accessible only to the high priests of the academy. This is the antithesis of the way science really works, as anyone who ever walked through a poster session at a conference would tell you. Yeah, science is about debate and rethinking. Even the most cherished of theories by the most revered of scientists can fall victim to the data of a graduate student. And that's a good thing. Yeah. Here's one reason for bringing it up, maybe the main reason. I think I know too few of us in the press, in media, have experienced the long, hard process of research, which is the hallmark of science. Those of us in the press and the media, and I do not accept myself from this criticism, 
We're always looking for easy answers and simple narratives. We're constantly worrying about what makes science relatable instead of what makes it truly compelling. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have been told that you need to explain your research in ways the public would find interesting? In, that's what I thought. Instead of explaining what you find interesting. To put it bluntly, I think you're getting the wrong advice. We need to let scientists explain what they are passionate about. That's the best approach to storytelling. If we rethink science communication, we can infuse it with a spirit of joy. We can show that great research is taking place around the globe by diverse scientists, many of whom don't have tenure at fancy institutions. We can democratize the pursuit of science, and we can focus on the journey of discovery as well as the results. I really believe with all my being that the public will respond. Now if, and this is a big if, but if we as storytellers have the support and freedom to experiment, science, my friends, should not be scary. Science is the greatest story on earth. I have joined some new efforts trying to change science communication in small, perhaps bigger ways later on. I'm eager to make this mission one of the chief efforts of this stage of my life. As some of you may know, I recently came out with a book called What Unites Us? Reflections on Patriotism. It was, and I appreciate, mentioned in the introduction. The book is a, a series of essays on what I think must be the foundation for a just, open-minded, and inclusive United States in this second decade of the 21st century. Alongside chapters on the right to vote, service, and a free press, I have included one on science, because as I write in What Unites Us, and I'm going to quote now from the book, quote, the United States was born in the spirit of science. What are we if not a great experiment? Our founding fathers, shaped by the age of reason, cast aside blind faith in kings for a bold hypothesis. Could a representative democracy based on certain unalienable rights succeed? Like any scientific hypothesis, our governing philosophy has been challenged, but we have kept the experiment viable by altering it through new laws and amendments to our Constitution, just as scientific theories change to reflect new knowledge. When the great histories of this nation are written centuries, perhaps millennia from now, I'm confident that the role of science will occupy many chapters. I desperately hope we can keep that narrative going and even growing. Our country's future place in the world depends on that." End of quote in the book. But of course, this effort is much bigger than the United States. Today, as I tried to make clear from the beginning, I'm honored to speak before a diverse international audience. This is a big part of what makes science so special. The collaborations, the mutual respect, and the common language among peoples. Science builds bridges. It deepens understanding. It points us to a more optimal path ahead. What should we do to make sure this world is a world of science? I think much of it has to start at an individual level and bubble upwards. It's vital that we have national and international organizations promoting science. But I think these mechanisms are already largely in place, these mechanisms. There is an impressive infrastructure around science. Just look at the AGU and the magnitude of this meeting. What these institutions could use, and what we all need in my opinion, is a groundswell of energy from a public more engaged and inspired by science. 
And I believe that can begin with relatively modest efforts, especially if the number of people engaging is large. We need citizens of science who reach out to their local communities to make their voices heard. It could be a special program in the local schools or just talking more about science with your own friends and family, telling them your stories of science. It could be writing to or meeting with your elected representatives to explain the importance of science. It could be creating interest groups with other scientists and seeing what experiences they have had with promoting science. Now, look folks, I know this all seems a bit small and maybe unfocused, but I've covered enough social movements to know that big change begins with small commitments and engagement. I saw it covering the civil rights movement. Yes, there were leaders like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., but there was the mass of people who made the movement possible. We'll need leaders to rise up to promote science, and we already have many. But leaders can't lead if they don't have those who will amplify their calls. What will make this movement thrive is tens of thousands of individual actions, no matter how small or insignificant they may seem at the time. And it will require that these stories are then told. I pledge here to play whatever small part I can and to try to rally others in my field to do the same. Let me close by emphasizing that modernity requires science. Modernity absolutely requires science. An improvement of the human condition requires science. Saving the planet requires science. You are doing the hard work. Let us now join in telling the story of science together so that we can embark on a new era of enlightenment and a leap forward with long new decades of discovery to build a new age of reason. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.